Good morning, Discovery Church. Um, we gave the projectors the Sunday off because we were going to be outside. So if you didn't get a lyric sheet on your way in or find on the app uh, where the lyrics are, uh, you can do that in just a moment because we're going to do greeting time in just a moment right after Brooklyn reads for us a call to worship. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And the first way we're going to worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness is by saying good morning and greetings to one another and sending the kids down to Discovery Village. Good morning, everybody. As you find your way back to your seats, we're going to begin with an oldie but a goodie. <clears throat> to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin. thousand reasons to praise the Lord. How's that for a segue?
seated. Uh, and uh, if you have children with you that would like to go down to Discovery Village and haven't yet, they may now at this point in time. Um, and we are going to recite the memory verse together, which is in your lyric sheet, but I forgot to change the, the name of the psalm. So Psalm 29 is there, but it says Psalm 103. Um, I'll pull it up a minute, and then we'll read it together, and then I want to say some things about it. You'd think I could have done this beforehand. There it is. All right. Let's read together. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf, Syrian like a young wild ox. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forests bare. And in his temple all cry glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. And you guys can make it down too. Um, so as I was reading this psalm for the first times this week, um, uh, I had a couple of questions. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk through a little bit of um, what I'm doing as I'm looking at a new passage. And then also... Um, there's treasures in the Bible, and I feel like I found some of those treasures this week that I wanted to share with you. So, that's what I'm going to do. So, my first questions as I'm reading through uh, are about the geography. There's a couple of places in there. Uh, Lebanon, the cedars of Lebanon, uh, Syrian, desert of Kadesh. Where are those places? Well, I looked it up. Um, I, uh, if you're familiar with the shape of Israel, let's say if this is the land of Israel, you have uh, on the west side where my face is, that is the Mediterranean Sea, yes? Lebanon, where's Lebanon? Anybody know? It's towards the north. Lebanon is towards the north. Uh, Syrian is also a name for Mount Hermon, which is the tallest mountain in Israel, tall enough that they have, it has uh, snow on it a lot of the time. Um, and that would also be up near Lebanon. Uh, and then the desert of Kadesh, I got two answers on that one. One was either in the south or possibly, this is also desert on the east side, so it could be on the east side. But um, that's the first piece. Um, as you're reading it, there's one main image in the, in the middle part of the verse. Did anybody pick up on the, on the, the main image? It's like thunder, lightning. There's a storm, right? Um, so uh, I read through this a few times, and I'm, I'm thinking, uh, how do we connect the first part, the middle part, and the last part? Well, the first part, to me, 
is a little abstract. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. What glory are we ascribing to the Lord? You know, it'd be nice if we had an image of what does that look like? Um, so that's what the middle piece is. It's a storm, right? And as, as you read through it, it, it tracks the movement of a storm going across. Um, so I'm going to read that in a minute, and you can sort of follow. It starts on the sea, goes over Lebanon, over Mount Hermon, over the desert. It's a pretty, pretty clear, direct image there. Um, and then, um, so that this part, I think the storm imagery is, is uh, a good description of what does the glory of God look like, possibly. What's an example, right? Um, would be a great thing to... Uh, share with kids, which is one of the things I read, that maybe this was a psalm recited for the kids during storms. Um, there's one word that comes back at the end of the description of the storm, and that's the same word that's in the beginning, glory. What does the glory of God look like? Well, at the end, and in his temple all cry glory. So I'm going to read the psalm again, um, and uh, you can just close your eyes and imagine it, but when we get to that line, if we do it right, it should feel pretty natural to, for all the people to say glory, right? Like a storm. Uh, so that's the first piece. Let me read this for you. Um, I was a drama nerd in high school, so I'm going to indulge that a little bit. Ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. And what does that look like? The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty waters. You can imagine the storm clouds way out over the sea. You know where they're coming. They're coming here. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. The Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. These cedars are known for their strength. They were what the temple was built with. They're, they're a big deal. He makes Lebanon leap like a calf. Syrian, that is Mount Hermon, like a young wild ox. You can imagine as the lightning flashes. The whole earth sort of rumbles and, and, and jumps. The voice of the Lord strikes with flashes of lightning. The voice of the Lord shakes the desert. The Lord shakes the desert of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord twists the oaks and strips the forest bare. And in his temple all cry, glory. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord is enthroned as king forever. The Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. The storm's ended, and it is very peaceful. So that is an image for Israel. Now, there's something else going on here, too. Um, the people of Israel uh, dealt a lot with uh, the Canaanites uh, and their pagan gods, in particular, um, Baal. Uh, does anybody know what Baal is the god of? Thunder. And fertility. So, here's the poem for a different audience. Um, you ascribe to the Lord, you heavenly beings. That could refer to angels. It also could refer to other entities that are seen as gods in the land. So, maybe Baal. Ascribe to the Lord, that would be uh, Yahweh, the God of Israel, right? Um, so now this is a poem for the Canaanites and for their gods. Uh, and who is, in this poem, the god of thunder? The god who controls the thunder in the storms? It is Yahweh. It's not Baal. It's Yahweh. Um, and you can see that image all throughout there. And then there's even one little, one little key, which I would encourage you to read this in some other translations because it looks different. Uh, verse 9, the voice, of the, oak, the voice of the Lord twists the oaks. There's a footnote. Um, or makes the deer give birth. I'm not sure how twist the oaks means makes the deer give birth, but apparently it does in Hebrew. 
Uh, but that also is a call out to Baal, the god of fertility. So even our god, Yahweh, is god over birth and fertility. And at the end, he sits above all of this. He's not the storm. He controls the storm. And uh, the way they use the Lord there, it means Yahweh. All throughout this, it's not, um, uh, it's not just any old God. It's, it's our God. It's my God. He's the one that's over Baal and over all the storms. So as you're reading it and memorizing it this month, there are some images for you to carry with you. And that's all I've got. You know, Tony, I could have given you the passage of uh, uh, Second Peter 1, and you could be up here just a little bit longer if you wanted to. <laughs> Thank you, Tony. Hey, as we gather, there are some prayer pads in the front of each section, and these prayer pads give us the opportunity to pray for each other or to give praise to God for the way that he has worked in some way this past week. So as those prayer pads make their way, Please make sure they make it all the way to the back that everyone has the opportunity to write something down. And then those uh, prayer requests and those praises then get mailed out on Monday and also throughout the week. Our scripture passage that we're looking at once again as we looked at last Sunday is 2 Peter chapter 1. And I'll be reading and reflecting on verses 3 through 11. So as I read it, I invite you to join with me by standing either in your heart or physically before God as we hear these words from the book that we love. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them you may participate in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption in the world caused by evil desires. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God's very words. Thanks be to God, and you may be seated. I woke up to find out it's broken. Can't be. Can't be broken. But it is. I'm going to start my morning without my freshly ground coffee. That little contraption just wouldn't work. But Renee played around with it just long enough to grind those coffee beans. But I knew its day had come to an end. So later that day, I went down to the shop of my buddy Craig, who owns a coffee shop, to uh, buy another coffee bean grinder. He didn't have an electric one. He had a hand one. I thought, well, I'll give it a try. Why not? And that way, if I have to do it sometime, it makes less noise and it wakes less people up. Wow, does that make a great pot of coffee. And I never would have known that if my old coffee bean grinder hadn't broken down. God works in our lives that way sometimes, doesn't he? There are things in our lives that are just kind of sputtering along, 
And then we experience a bit of a crisis. And he wakes us up. It's a search for something better. And the search for something better always leads to him. He is that better thing. Sometimes God brings these experiences in our lives to wake us up. And uh, it makes us realize our souls look a little bit like this. Now, if you were here last Sunday or if you were watching electronically, everyone had a, a three by five card and they had to write this part of a verse, which you can all read, right? This is me doing it with my left hand blindfolded, like everyone who was here last Sunday had to do. I can do all things through Christ. And sometimes these experiences wake us up to realize the condition of our soul, not the condition of our circumstances, but the condition of our soul. And to realize God has something much better for our soul, something more clear, more effective, more loving, more joyful. There are some people who just go through life with a messy soul, whether it is a, they decide to go with a messy soul or they don't realize how messy their soul is. And that's why sometimes God sends experiences to us so that we can proceed to what is better for something like this in our soul, in spite of whatever circumstances may be. Last week, we began by looking at first or second Peter chapter one, and we're going to continue looking at second Peter chapter one. What's interesting is that even though I call this Holy Spirit living, what is not mentioned at all in this passage is the Holy Spirit. But it all talks about the things that the Holy Spirit does in our lives when we pursue and search after those things that are better, the things of God. And so I believe that this is a, a passage that talks about what happens when we open up our lives to the Spirit to work within, because all Christian tradition says that when we receive Jesus Christ into our life, we also receive the Holy Spirit who moves and works and leads us to the good things of God. So for these next two or three minutes, I'm just going to review where we were last week. And you can follow along in your outline in the bulletin. It talks about that, the things that we focused in on. It talked about the, uh, the importance of spiritual growth, and I shared three things about that. I said, first of all, spiritual growth is possible. It's possible because we have the Holy Spirit within us. And when the Holy Spirit comes within us, he implants in us God's DNA. He gives to us God's very divine nature. And that's what it says in the passage, verses 3 to 4. His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life. We are lacking nothing to lead that kind of life. Through our knowledge of him, who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he has given us his very great and precious promises, so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. Growing is not simply a matter of what we know or what we don't know. It's being open up to the work of the Holy Spirit who has given to us God's very DNA. Spiritual growth is possible. Spiritual growth is also progressive. When we yield to the Spirit's work, growth comes over time. Verse 8, for if you possess these qualities in increasing measures, in increasing measures. 1 Peter 2, 2 says when you become a Christian, you become a baby Christian. You are not born again as an adult Christian. You are a baby Christian and you grow into maturity. Just like any other infant, it doesn't matter how much milk you throw down that infant's throat, they will only grow taller at the rate that they were designed for. And because of that, spiritual growth can often be frustrating. We can say, I don't see it in my life. Uh, but we also need to remember we have a three mile an hour God 
not a hundred mile an hour God. He works slowly, progressively. And spiritual growth is necessary. When grace comes into our life, God expects, expects us to join with the work of the Holy Spirit to show that there's spiritual growth. Verse 10, therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. And those words, calling and election, talk about the grace that God has given to us. He always gives to us grace first. Therefore, we work out that grace. The works that are done to change us are the works that have been done by Jesus Christ on the cross. He's the one who pardons us. He forgives us. And when we truly believe that, then we join with the Spirit's work in our life. That leads us to the second point, and that is that spiritual growth can be hard. It's hard to do. Verse 5, for this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness. And then Anna goes. It joins two different words. It talks about adding and it talks about make every effort. What's interesting about make every effort is that that was a word that was used in the first century. It was a secular word. It was the word that was used to mean that someone was investing capital in a artistic production like a play, just like today, right? Uh, if you want to put a production on, you need backers. You need someone who's willing to invest, to put the money down up front. And that's what that word means. Investors risk a lot. They don't test the waters. They don't dangle their feet. When an investor comes into a production, they are all in. They are all in. So what Peter is saying here, when we come to Jesus Christ and follow him, we don't just dabble with him. We come being all in and investing all that we have. Or another phrase, you, we jump into the deep end and allow God to work in us. And I shared three ways in which it is difficult to grow, why spiritual growth is hard. Three different disciplines to engage in. Last week I talked about the first of the three, and that is spiritual growth is difficult because suffering comes. And when suffering comes, we need to continue to submit to God. That word that's in there in verses 5, 6, and 7, perseverance. Perseverance means you stay put. It means you bear up. It means you stand your ground. And God will use this time of suffering and yieldedness to him to grow something great for him. Before your time of suffering, what were you doing to grow your spiritual soul? Continue on in those things. We tend to stop them, but he calls us to continue on in them. And we will be amazed of what God will do. Spiritual growth is hard because there are times of suffering in our life that makes us want to stop. But persevere, it says. Secondly, the second discipline that we need to engage in and why spiritual growth is hard is because we need to spend time with God, which seems very obvious to most of us. But I include that in there because we tend to bank on our spiritual past and to believe that I've already done enough, I've already learned enough, I've already grown enough. Growing in God, and it says that, or growing in our knowledge, it says that in verses 3 and 8. Knowledge in the Bible is never simply input. It's never just information, material, that you put in a jarhead. Knowledge in the New Testament is always about relationship, growing in relationship and understanding someone through relationship. The spiritual discipline we engage in is growing in our continual relationship and walk. Just like our friends, right? 
if we stop spending time with friends, we grow apart. When we stop spending time with God, we tend to grow apart. It's not simply just information, it's relationship. And that takes time. And that's why spiritual growth can be hard, because it takes time. Thirdly, a third discipline, which might be rather shocking, a third discipline of why spiritual growth can be difficult is because we need to be vulnerable with people. We need people, and we need to be vulnerable and open to others. There's a list there in verses 5, 6, and 7. And in verse 7, it says, to add to godliness mutual affection. That translated is brotherly love. Brotherly love. Be engaged with others. With a brother and a sister, you know them well. At least you should know them well. You share a common history. You share a common experience. It's often the same with friends, too. You share common experiences. But what if you have a sibling who is also your best friend? What would that be like? And that's the relationship that Peter is talking about here in chapter 1. That our friendships, our relationships, should be like a sibling relationship, a sisterly, a brotherly relationship. We all need to have people in our life that we give a hunting license to, that they can speak into our life and our soul. We need people like that. We need to make sure we have deputized people to say the hard and the uncomfortable things that maybe we know but we're in denial about. Be vulnerable to people. Be open to them. Speaking the truth in love. Weeping when others weep. Rejoicing when others rejoice. These are the relationships that God uses to keep us in track, especially in difficult times. So why would I want to make this kind of commitment? Why would I want to have this kind of relationship with the Holy Spirit? When I know it's going to be slow, and I know it's going to be hard, and I know it's going to involve suffering, and I know it means I need to be vulnerable to others. Why? Why would I want to do this? It's in here, the why. It's in verse 7. Why should we be willing to invest in God? Why should I put skin in the game to grow in God? Add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness mutual affection. So here it comes, and to mutual affection, this is a progression, it ends with love. The why of all of this, says Peter, inspired by the Holy Spirit, is that we grow in love. We grow in being willing to be open to the pure love of God in our life and to be used by in, as instruments of him to show love to others. Because outside of Jesus Christ, our lives are self-centered. Our lives are about our happiness. Our lives are about the things that matter to us. But when Jesus Christ comes into our life, and the Holy Spirit comes and implants divine DNA in us, we become creatures who start to demonstrate more and more love. And that's what God wants to do in us, that we can receive that love and that we can give that love. When we're more concerned about other people being happy than our own happiness, when we're more concerned about how, how other people are doing than how we are doing. Those in the Bible are some of the characteristics of his love. Then ultimately, spiritual growth happens, it says, when we remember something important. 
verse 9. But whoever does not have them, these things, goodness, faithfulness, perseverance, self-control, leading to love, whoever does not have these things, the reason why, is because they are nearsighted and blind, forgetting, and that's the key word in this verse, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. If you are not growing in your faith and your walk with Jesus through the Holy Spirit at work in us, it says in verse 9, it's because we are not remembering what Jesus has done for us. We need to constantly remember that we have been saved not by our works, but we have been saved by grace. We have been saved by the blood of the cross. Yes, we remember that God is holy and wise and all-knowing and all-powerful, and those things are important to remember. But ultimately, we remember, Peter says, when we remember the suffering of what Jesus has done to change our lives. And when we remember that, we remember that we are the recipients of God's grace through the sacrifice of Jesus. We can bear up under suffering. We can joyfully serve. We can willingly say, I am all in on this adventure when we remember. In the Old Testament, God gave the instruction to care for the immigrant amongst them, to do social justice. God said, be good to the immigrants because you need to remember, it says, you were like them once. You were an immigrant who came out of Egypt. I led you out of Egypt, and you became an immigrant in the promised land. I brought you out. If I didn't bring you out, I brought your parents out, or I brought your grandparents out, or I brought someone out from your heritage. I brought them out. Remember that. And how you deal with the immigrant among you. And that applies to us as well. When we are impatient, because we feel we've been standing in the checkout line too long. Because a clerk or a customer doesn't have a really good grasp of the English language. Remember, you were in that position too. If not you, maybe your parent or a grandparent who had to learn English the hard way. Remember that. When we remember what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, it melts us. And when we forget, we become grumpy. It helps us to grow when we remember all that Jesus has done. When Jesus was on the cross, and he was crying out to the Father, Why have you forsaken me? Another translation of that word forsaken could be forgotten. Why have you forgotten me? Think of it. Jesus on the cross, crying out to the Father. How could the Father forget Jesus? Well, it happened for those few hours. It happens because Jesus got what we deserved. He didn't deserve that on the cross. We deserve that. And he willingly took our place on the cross to make payment for sin so that Father God would never, ever forget us. Never. Never would we be forsaken. Never would we be forgotten. He gave his everything that Father God would always remember us. What are the just desserts for people who forget God? And don't say that we 
always remember him. I, I don't. What should be our just desserts? Our just desserts should be that God should forget us. But it says in Isaiah 49, he has written our names in the palm of his hands. He never forgets us, ever. And that's why we come to the table, and we try to come to the table often. When we come to the communion table, it reminds us of the end of the day. He has never, ever forgotten us. He has done everything possible so that we can enjoy the goodness of being his kids, of being his daughter, of being his son. And at the end of the day, if we look back on our day and there has been something in our life that has been good, that has been just, that has been holy, that has been admirable, at the end of the day, it's him who gets the glory for that because he has done that work in us. One of the key words in the Old Testament that God drilled into the Hebrew people is that word, remember. Remember. Remember how God delivered you out of slavery in Egypt. Remember how he cleansed you through the blood at the altar. Remember all the things that God has rescued you from, from all the bad decisions that you have made. Remember. Remember the journey and remember those times of brokenness when you cried out to God like some of our monthly psalms have been of lamenting and crying out to God. At those times, remember his care and his presence with you in those deep, dark valleys. Remember. And so as we come to the table, we come remembering what Jesus has done for us. And an equally important word in the Old Testament that is paired up with remembering is the word thanksgiving. One of the four New Testament words that is used for the Lord's Supper or communion is that word Eucharist. Maybe that sounds familiar. Some Traditions like the Catholic tradition or the Episcopalian tradition will use that word Eucharist. The word literally means giving thanks. Giving thanks. To remind us that when we come to the table, it is a time for us to give thanks because all the work that is needed has been done by Jesus Christ. And how can we, as we come to grips with someone who gave himself completely for us, how can we not completely give ourselves to him out of thanksgiving? If we truly believe that we have been saved by the costly grace of Jesus, who gave his life for us, will there not be a desire that starts to build up inside to want to give our lives to him. So as we come to the table, we remember. We remember of all that Jesus has done for us and keeps doing for us. And we respond, not in pride, but in thankfulness. And he renews our faith and stirs up our soul to want to follow him. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Father God, how we thank you so much for the grace you've given to us through Jesus Christ. Thank you that he went all in and offering himself so that there could be the promise given to us that you, Father God, would never, ever forget us, even in our very dark moments. Thank you. Thank you for giving to us your Holy Spirit who has implanted in us your DNA so that we can grow in you and display the attributes of the divine. 
and when they are evident in us, it comes back to you who receives the glory and the credit and the honor. Thank you for giving to us your table, your table that reminds us of the great truths and calls us to surrender once again, to live thankful lives in response to your sacrifice. Father God, we lift up our, our needs to you, needs of our family, of people who need to be uh, encouraged and for your spirit to uplift and to hold them. We pray for uh, Renee's brother, Ed, who uh, continues to slip in terms of his uh, physical alertness and awareness and we pray lord that you will continue to make your presence and your care powerfully powerfully felt in his life and his wife's life we pray for dan who continues to uh, meet with doctors to find out uh, what it is that's going on with his heart and in the meantime we pray that you will give to uh, dan and rosemary your your care your presence your comfort we pray for the Jansma family and for uh, Sid's dad and the further tests that he has from the cancer has been found. We pray that you will surround their entire family, Lord, with your love and your care. Uphold them. We pray for families that are struggling and we pray, Lord, that you will bring uh, renewal and restoration and whatever is needed. We pray for Pam and David and Joe that you will provide whatever it is that they stand in need of, providing a, that place for Pam to be where she can find uh, ongoing care, and for Joe and David as well. Once again, we bless you so much for your love given to us through Jesus. We thank you that we can experience your love and your grace in greater and greater measure. Help us, Lord, to continue to pursue you in all these areas of life. We pray them. We offer up our prayers to you in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and everyone agreed and said, Amen. So this morning, if you have a personal relationship with Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we invite to you to join us in taking the bread and the cup. And if for any reason you decide not to, we honor that. We honor that decision. We just simply ask you to remain where you are in your seat. You may join in the worship team as they lead in song or use the time for reflection and prayer. We're going to begin uh, up here in the front in the gathering of a semicircle of myself and Elder Sharon, uh, our prayer servant, our worship team, and we're going to uh, participate in communion first. Uh, as we do that, everyone will be handed a piece of bread. And after everyone has received that bread, we will all take it together. And then everyone will be passed a communion cup. And when everyone in the semicircle has received that, we will take that together. And then at that time, our ministry teams will then go to their place to uh, to minister, whether in song or prayer or serving communion. We invite you to come as households or to come up as groups and to form a semicircle of six or eight or 12. Uh, Elder Sharon is going to remain up here in front. I am going to be in the back. There's another communion station in back, and I am going to be there. For households with children we invite you to come forward with your children and uh, we will do uh, the best we can to ask you as parents if you want your children to receive communion whether you believe uh, that they have an understanding of what that is like or or whatever it is that is is uh, your reason we want to honor that parents so we're going to try to ask you what it is that you desire for your children and just like in the circle up front, everyone will be given a piece of bread, and when everyone has been served, we'll take it together. Then everyone will uh, receive a cup 
and we will take that together and then you can go back to your seats and then there might be another group that comes to the front or another group that goes to the back. And whether your child or young person receives communion or you decide not to, uh, Julie Garrett is going to be our prayer servant and she's going to be in the back corner. And we would be really honored if you parents would bring your children back to Julie so that she would be able to uh, offer up a, a prayer of blessing on the children who are present here. I believe I have all that covered. So you can either come to the front or you can go to the back. So scripture tells us that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took the bread at that Passover meal and broke it and said, this is my body given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup and said, this is the blood of the covenant, pointing to his blood that is shed for the complete forgiveness sin. So ever since that time at the Last Supper, the church has met for 2,000 years and at times gathering to remember, to celebrate, and to offer their lives thankfully back to God. So this time I'd like to invite uh, Sharon and Julie and our worship team to join me in the front.
be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your face. Oh, wanderer, come home, you're not too far. So lay down your heart, lay down your heart, dark as you are.
with every breath I long to follow Jesus for he has said that he will bring me home and day by day I know he will renew me until I stand with joy before the throne to this I hold reminder that as prayer pads made their way back, if there was something more that came to your mind that you would like a prayer for, uh, you can write it on one of those prayer pads. You can email it in to the, uh, the office anytime during the week, and we'll make sure that it gets out. Or if you're just in need of prayer, you can always go to the back corner where Paul and Julie are now, and they'd be honored to minister to you in prayer. It's nearing the end of summer. Things are winding down, so we don't have a whole lot going on. Uh, but tomorrow morning, check your Monday memos, because there is a great picture of Ken at the ball game, enjoying it, and we enjoyed having him there too. So I think more people spend time talking and shuffling together than they did actually watching the game. But that's part of what it's all about. So uh, we do have one more event for the summer that's coming up in, in a few weeks. It's just called a yard sale. It's going to be on a Saturday afternoon. We're inviting our neighbors and our Discovery family. If you want to bring some things to try to sell, we're going to try to set up booths on the front yard. And um, we got a big black sign we're going to stick out in front all week to let people know there's a yard sale happening on Saturday. And hopefully that will help to draw some people in to come and to uh, be a part of it. The grill is going to be going. Some other food is going to be available. So even if you're not in, in the business of looking for other people's stuff, you can still come and hang out and enjoy. So that's coming up the last Saturday in August. So as we go from here into God's world, receive his parting blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his countenance upon you, smile down on you, wrap his arms all the way around you, and give to you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. Go in peace. Mm -hmm.